we have the, in, the capacity, the knowledge, and the resources to address this problem very effectively and very successfully and very sustainably. The question is why aren't we using them? And I hope you have provoked enough interest so that in our few minutes for discussion, we may be able to answer the question, if these tools are available, why aren't we using them? And what we need to do to make it happen? I think that's part of your job as advocate, to be voice for the voiceless, as space for the poor. I was especially intrigued by your attention to the problems of indoor pollution. Because when we look at the inequities and the disparities, we look at the dip deprivations and not enough on the health problem. Some years ago, UNEP did a study that showed that the air quality indoors in some of the developing sm uh, smoke-filled rooms in the developing countries was worse than the quality of the air outdoors. And so you have a very serious en uh, environmental hazard where none could escape. So I think this is rather important uh, that we tend to focus on the health side of the equation. I was also encouraged by the fact that you, you did, did reinforce Governor Pataki's points about the mixes that are available. And developing countries might now start looking at different kinds of combination. Mini hydro, for example, is something that might be given much more attention uh, than we have in the past. So I think you've laid out uh, some challenges for us very elegantly, and I hope we'll, you'll get the kind of response that help your work. Because this kind of conference is not just a feel-good conference. It's an attempt to bring the parties and partners together into the private sector to see what can be done and how we might go about doing it. So thank you very much. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce my second colleague, Verle Vanderverd, who is the Director of Environment and Energy Group at the Bureau for Development Policy on the United Nations Development Programme. Since 1999, she's held positions as the coordinator of the Global Program of Action for the Protection of the Marine Environment against land-based source of pollution. It's another mouth-filling title. The protection of the marine environment from land-based sources of pollution. And uh, she's also been the coordinator of the UNEP's regional seas program. That is the semi-enclosed seas of the world, the kind of ribbon uh, edge of the oceans where a lot of activities and damage happen. And this morning, it's my pleasure to invite her to address the question of the energy challenge. Verla, you have the floor. Uh, well, thank you very much, Verla. Not only have you outlined the challenge, but you issued an invitation to cooperate and to partner with your office and the UN generally to see if we can indeed develop a secure energy future for all. I hope our colleagues from the climate community was listening because you outlined an agenda for, for Copenhagen. You listed the item that should be considered, particularly in the energy sector, and most certainly I would hope that this seeps through and at least in the final document, energy will be also addressed as a key factor. Energy security, we've made several references to that this morning, uh, but yet I didn't hear anyone talk about the security challenge that is generated by competition for available source of energy. Because in the future, as we look down the energy pathway, I think there's going to be intensification of competition and possible conflict here. So, I would hope that we can address this question in, as part of our dis discussion. But ladies and gentlemen, you've heard our two presenters. They've agreed that we had the, the knowledge, the resources are there. Where is the will? What is preventing action on a sustained basis in an accelerated way? So I'd like to open the floor. I think we have about 15 minutes for observations, comments, reactions, and remarks. The floor is open. Yes, sir. By the way, the earphones are uh, available, so if we, you cannot hear from the podium, please use the earphones. Yes, sir. Yes. Um, being here yesterday and today, um, I've been listening to a number of different presentations on the energy problems surrounding the world, the um, look at um, different ways of producing energy. One thing that I would think when you're dealing with underdeveloped countries is an issue of education, whether there's a lack of education, whether there's a need of education in those areas, in order to effectively put into place an energy plan in underdeveloped countries. Where there's a lack of education, uh, there's often, uh, what you're dealing with is often history, superstition, and belief. Uh, and when you're dealing with that, then there's a lack of understanding 
of what's necessary in the energy community. It's just an observation I had. I didn't know if you'd had, have any comments on that. But it's a very insightful one because I think energy literacy among the poor is also critical in trying to develop the policies that are necessary. But ladies, I think you may have some reactions and comments about education and dealing with the, prop, the energy challenge. Yes, Verle. Um, thank you, Nural. Indeed, this was this, what I was referring to by saying that we really need capacity building for institutional strengthening. Because, in fact, what we have um, experienced in our work in the field is that people, first of all, are not aware, you know, on, on the importance of energy access, you know, for helping people to get out of poverty, on the possibilities of the grid they are available, you know, and on which institutional and regulatory systems they need to put in place. And so the cost for providing energy access to the 2.5 billion unserved is quite high in the first phases because you really need to do a lot of education, awareness, building, institutional strengthening. And that very often is not considerate. When we discuss in the international field, you know, providing energy access to the poor, we look at the hardware. And we forget exactly what you were referring to, that there is, in fact, if we want to make it sustainable uh, in the long run, that there is a whole set of educational activities to take place at the local level, in the villages, with the women's group, in order to make them aware and put in place the mechanism to make this energy access sustainable. And that is something, I think, when we discuss how to further address or provide energy to the poor people, we should give much more importance to. We call this capacity development, capacity building, but in fact, it's education. Thank you, sir. What is doing? Where is the education piece in the argument? Where is the education initiatives to address the problem that you're talking about? You, you outline the challenge and you make it as desirable as possible that there should be, a, but I'm not sure I'm, I'm clear who is doing it. I think, um, as, I also, as I also mentioned, it's not one person or one institute who can do it. That's really something which we all will have to do together. The private sector, you know, the governments, the civil society and the UN. I think as UN we can set the example, we can test it. And for example, with the Bill Gates um, Foundation money, we are providing energy access to six million people in rural Africa, you know, on a very sustainable manner particularly not only energy access, but also um, agro-industrial um, agro pow uh, power. But, you know, six million people. In fact, the, 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 it's a, a business model which could be upscaled. And if the local business people, with the support of the international community, would pick up this model, we could provide energy access to most of the poor women in rural Africa. So I think we have the knowledge, which was said before. We have a technology, but we need to jointly work together. And we need jointly to shift the paradigm and not only look at quick returns on financing, which is what the business community is about, but really look in a more longer term and really see if we create markets there for sustainable energy uh, provision, you know, how can we, in fact, on the longer term, create a, a, a group of people who also can join, you know, the business community. Hunter, did you have a... Popular. We've heard all of this that has been said this morning, with the exception of a couple specifics from the governor. Since Stockholm, through Rio, through Joburg, every COP meeting, UN's good at talking. If you want to know what you can do, look up. Change your light bulbs right here in this building, and then start working with the NGOs. If you guys were here yesterday, you would have heard Dr. Bernard Amade talking about taking children out of the sex trade in Afghanistan and teaching them how to make briquettes. They are now in business. They are generating revenue. This is, these are two NGOs, Afghans for Tomorrow and Engineers Without Borders. Does the UN fund them? No. No, I sat with Raymond Wright in Jamaica and went over those same numbers of Jamaica's dependence on petroleum and laid out a program for ecotourism, bamboo, energy production in the Dolphin Head Mountains. Is it in practice now? No. The answers are all here. Yesterday, SunTech showed pictures of solar panels on yurts in China.